two cousins enjoying the seas off the coast of Mexico when the jaunt turns serious. Washed up on a barren island, they wait for rescue. You'll be home in time for dinner. Like some cruel joke, just 12 miles of sea lie between them and safety. But this sea is impossible to cross. Hammerheads are one of the few species of known uh, man-eaters. And the boats do not come. Exposed to searing temperatures, without water they have just days to live. Their survival becomes a test of endurance. I realized that we could actually die on this island. After a tiring 10-hour drive through the desert, Mark Sorensen and Rob Rusnak have almost reached the coast. From here, these young adventurers will begin the sailing trip of a lifetime. Hey, how about a good song? Something nice. Song. Something, something appropriate to this beautiful Mexican landscape. Driving down, you know, we were uh, joking, lighthearted, excited, all the things that you would think you would be uh, when you're heading into an adventure. La cucaracha, la cucaracha, no. ya no puedo caminar. I was really excited, you know, I, I had all these uh, thoughts of how this was all going to happen. So it was it was very exciting. Well, if you're going to do it, sing it like you mean it. You sing it with la me. La cucaracha, la cucaracha, ya no puedo caminar. La cucaracha, la cucaracha. Their long drive from San Diego will end at their launch point, Bahia de Los Angeles. It's on the eastern side of the Baja Peninsula and is part of Mexico. The cousin's plan is to sail round trip across the Sea of Cortez on a 16-foot catamaran, a dangerous voyage at the best of times. Their nights will be spent camping on the myriad of islands across the sea. Until they finish the 160-mile round trip, no one is expecting to hear from them. Wow. Incredible. Beautiful. When you see this placid blue of the Sea of Cortez stretching out in front of you and these dramatic islands coming out out of the sea, seeing that was fantastic. Wow, we're here, you know, this is what we were looking for. It's begun. Mark loved the idea of doing this crossing in such a small vessel because it was more challenging. He doesn't think probably anybody had ever tried it in a 16-foot cat before. Mark's my cousin. I basically met him for the first time in, uh, as a young teenager. He was about 14 years older than me, almost like a big brother. But uh, we would get together to do a camping trip uh, here and there. Right in the middle of the cat? Yeah. Oh, man. Rob was about 26 years old at the time. Not so much a little brother or a little cousin, but more a peer-to-peer uh, -peer partner. The kind of adventure that we're often looking for borders between Weekend Warrior and Death Wish in that gray area between those things. Ready? Yes! Thank you. <laughs> Is baby gonna hold out? There's too much on it. Rob did see me as a, a, a mentor in terms of teaching him the, the basics of, of sailing. That doesn't sound good. I mean, you're the sailor, but too much weight on a boat. Boat sinks, right? Boat won't sink. Look, let's leave the wetsuits and the, uh, the thick clothes. It'll be hot the whole time. Are you sure? Yeah. I'm going to try and uh, spread the weight out a bit, see if it helps. You give me a hand with this water. Heavy? About 80 pounds. The eight gallon tank is almost like another person, when, especially when you consider the, the other gear that we had tied down. It's perfect sailing weather. 
but the winds across the Sea of Cortez are notoriously difficult to predict, adding a twisted thrill to the journey. I love sailing because of the, the sense of uh, freedom, of being out on the open water. There's also an element of speed because once you get going on a catamaran, it's a feeling of like flying. Just enjoy the ride. Yeah! We're gonna fly across the Cortez. What happened to the wind? No, it happens. I read about it. 60 miles an hour to zero like that. I think it's because we're like in a canyon. The wind rattles down here like an alley and then woof, it's gone. In the dead calm, the heat builds to over 120 degrees. And there's no chance to cool down in this sea. Watch out for hammerheads. You mentioned sharks, you didn't mention hammerheads. Weren't hammerheads like the psychopath of the shark world? Would you be at peace with yourself if you had a head shape like that? The Sea of Cortez is, is not a, a place to be taken lightly. I had seen a documentary about hundreds of hammerhead sharks moving through this part of the Sea of Cortez. Hammerheads are, are one of the few species of known uh, man-eaters in the world and are known to be aggressive. This is something we want to keep our eyes open for. You imagine catching one of those on the end of your line? Yeah, maybe drag us into the nearest island. Be like Jaws. Three hours later, the wind picks up as swiftly as it disappeared. But the dead calm was a warning, a forerunner to something much more sinister on the horizon. Don't like the look of those clouds. Something's kicking up over there. Coming out of the north was some kind of a squall or weather front. So we were kind of worried that, wow, what if this is something big rolling through that was not expected and that's going to be here for a while? We might have to forget about the crossing and head back. But we might have to. Fuck, small savage storms. Squalls. We get caught in one, we're sitting ducks. I'm sorry, Rob. I'm turning around. Fuck. I think we got water on the portside pontoon. A small crack has opened up in the pontoon as it pounds the waves. There's no way to bail and the catamaran starts to become dangerously unstable in the squall. One big gust of wind, which was probably approaching about 60 uh, or so miles per hour, uh, hit us. We ended up in the water, tangled up in the sheets uh, with tattered sails in the water and you know rigging everywhere. I thought, oh my god, you know, I, this thing is going to crush my head. And so I thought for sure this boat's going to take my head off. Absolutely, I was scared. Is it me? Is it now really cold in here? Let's get the cat back up. We were both getting very cold on the, on the verge of hypothermia. I was shivering uncontrollably. I was very uncoordinated. With the shredded sails and stricken pontoon, the catamaran keeps capsizing as Rob and Mark battle with the waves, their gear and the water barrel drift away. Everything we're doing, everything we're trying is going wrong. And I said, well, what do we do now, just die? And when he said that, that brought in basically a flood of emotion where you're going, you know, this, this could be it. And what a ridiculous way to go. They're weak. And in this storm, a 12-mile swim to the mainland is out of the question. With no boat, the threat of being eaten by hammerheads is now all too real. Using every last ounce of energy they possess, Mark and Rob head for the closest island. It's now their only hope of survival.
Getting up onto the shore was so incredible in terms of just the mental relief of having dry land uh, under your feet. I think that it was a, a combination of, of just good luck and maybe somebody up there looking out for us. Safe for the moment on an island called Guardian Angel. We were soaked to the core and we uh, stripped all our clothes off and got in our sleeping bags and got into a fetal position to try to conserve warmth. We were probably in pretty advanced stages of hypothermia. You're still shivering like crazy, but you know you've got a little cocoon of, of what will eventually become warmth as your body heats up the damp parts of the sleeping bag. We're up. You okay? At this point, uh, your, your mind is playing tricks on you. You, you. You're not thinking clearly. And I saw this very strange light-colored thing that was jumping around on the ground. Rob, Rob, wake up. I'm awake. There's something over there. I'm not opening my eyes. Look. I assumed at that point that this was some kind of animal that was kind of circling us and, and checking out uh, our campsite. I'm not opening my eyes. Because I'm thinking, here I am in my bed in San Diego. But if I open my eyes, I might actually be on a desert island freezing cold with no water. So I'm not opening my eyes. Look at me. Open your I'm eyes. I'm not opening open my eyes. Open your eyes. Look. It's a rock. Do you honestly think that's a rock? Now go to sleep. Wake up, dude. Wake up. The good news is, is the catamaran's sitting on the beach. Yeah? The bad news is it's in a million pieces. Wow. Must have taken a hell of a beating against the rocks. At this point, we realized we're going to be on this hot, dry, no water, no food, island and situation. And we're gonna have to figure out how we're going to cope with this. You wanna try and swim it? Gonna be eaten by a hammerhead? We could climb out. Oh, this cliff's gotta be 100 feet high. You get to the top, there'll be a ridge and then another cliff 100 feet high. It's gonna be over 110 degrees by midday. Without water, oh, you wouldn't make it 50 feet. And then I'd have to watch your dead body fall back to the beach. So, no thanks, bud. So we're trapped. Guardian Angel Island is a barren piece of volcanic rock, surrounded by shark-infested seas. It's 40 miles long and five miles wide, and the high cliffs mean that Mark and Rob can't escape from their narrow piece of shoreline. To get around those cliffs, you'd either have to go up over them or you'd have to swim around them. But at this point, uh, thoughts of the hammerhead sharks, thoughts of how far that actually was, this was going to be a long swim in shark-infested waters and uh, was not something that we would probably survive. The swim would be suicide. And with nowhere to climb to, Mark and Rob are in a prison 
with sand at their feet and the sun in the sky. I think we can make it. It might take a day, but we can do it. We'd never make it. It's got to be 12 miles away. Our splashing would attract the hammerheads and who knows what else. We're weak, dehydrated, and if the sharks don't get you, the current will. Let's build a raft then. With what? There's no trees, no wood. We're on a desert island, my friend. There's usually an oasis, isn't there? Well, not on this one. This is a desert, desert island. Typical of all the islands to get washed up on. <laughs> I'm gonna try it. There's nothing to seal the end of it with. I'm gonna try it. It won't float. It'll be fine. The fishing boat will be passed soon. They'll pick us up, take us back to the car. You'll be home in time for dinner. The only things that we didn't lose in the water were the items that were in our dry bags. Well, we've got a book, a half of, a knife, about 20 matches, and some soaking wet cookies. I think I found that animal that was stalking you last night. You did? Yeah, kind of reddish in color. Moved up and down in a strange way. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. What, are you afraid of balloons? Cinco de Mayo, the 5th of May. Huh? Must have blown over from the mainland. And? It's a Mexican holiday. It's like Independence Day. It's a national holiday that the last four or five days. Everyone takes part. Cool. Even the fishermen. Shit. No one will be on the sea for a few days. We don't have enough to last, do we? Rob. Rob. After we saw that balloon, you know, uh, our spirits basically dipped pretty low. At least mine did. We might be in for a pretty long wait before we saw anybody in our area. Uh, it was really starting to get to me. The two men are very exposed on their island. Just a day without water in this heat, and they'll be dead. After the sun came up on the island, there was a limited breeze coming through there. So you can just feel the heat, you know, 110, 120 degrees. And you can just feel this heat getting hotter and hotter all morning long. And the sun was just beating on you all day. There was no shade to be had anywhere. Much better. I basically stayed completely closed, but even doing all that, you know, the parts, a few parts of my skin that were exposed got burned. How you doing? You didn't manage to find any sunblock on the salvage, did you? It's starting to burn up. Certainly any kind of humor that we, that we could come up with helped to break the tedium and the, just the sense of despair that, that starts to sink in. We have to find a few things, otherwise we're gonna be dead before morning in this heat. You know those guys in the movies in the desert going, water, water? Yeah. I know how they feel. There really is no way to drink seawater. Man, it'll destroy your kidneys and make you go mad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. We'll leave that as a last resort. Hmm? <clears throat> what else we got around here? We have to find shelter and food. Nothing. Hey, wait a sec. I think John Wayne. I don't think he's going to help us now. <laughs> well, you remember the Westerns from the 40s and 50s? Don't Indians get water from cactus? Wait, aren't cactuses like protected species? I can remember from being a little kid and watching things on TV, you can cut into a nice thick uh, cactus and find fresh water. 
What if it's poisonous? Are cactus poisonous? I skipped that class in school. Yes! Huh? Nothing. What? Nothing's coming out. Maybe we gotta suck the pulp. Get the juice that way. After you. Well, let's not stand on ceremony. <coughs> tastes like, tastes like warm bile. I can't handle this. No, keep going. This is for the water. <coughs> Our tongues were swelling, and it was, you know, very parched throat, and, and it gets kind of hard to breathe. And this immediately cleared up that. The taste was just very nasty, bitter but the moisture was definitely uh, a relief. We tried to experiment with different parts of the cactus. The lower on the base we went, it became woody, so there was not much moisture. Nothing. Are you sucking hard enough? I'm giving it all I got. So the base is too dry. Let's try the tips. What's it like? Oh. Ah, it's a little sour. <laughs> Maybe we just stick to the middle. So we had to basically stick with uh, the chest high part of the cactus. Now the men have some form of moisture. They need to get out of the sun's burning rays. What little shade there was came from uh, the cactus, which was, you know, yay wide, and you could catch a little bit of shade. It's my turn. We still have more time. It's not true. Get off! More time! This is ridiculous. We have to find proper shelter. There was no shade to be had anywhere, so we we're able to salvage enough of the boat, the trampoline part of the boat, as well as the sails and the boom, and we were able to basically make a tent shelter. Well, that's done. Five star. <laughs> and that made a reasonable shelter to get out of the sun, but it would become exceedingly hot during the day. It just became like an oven inside that shelter. With shelter in place, protecting them from the sun, it's now time to deal with the increasing hunger pains. We did still have a the possibility of fishing, but we definitely stayed in the shallow parts because obviously there were sharks out there. I'm now officially starving. Don't make it too obvious. Take a look to your left, two o'clock. See what I see? I see lunch. Do you think it's seen us? I don't know. What? Head towards it. Let's see what it does. What? They're pretty stupid. They got a brain the size of a pea. I think it's seen me. Move around a bit. Throw them off the scent. There was no way that you could actually sneak up on these things. Left, left, left. Go left. No, he's coming back. Get between him and the water. These things, you know, have eyes that are looking all directions, and no way could we get close. Oh, just jump for it! Man! 
That was pathetic. Except it's got like ten legs. I've only got two. It's back. No, don't look. Pretend like we haven't seen it. How do you know it's the same one? I know that grab anyway. I'll go around the back and jump it. The classic pincer movement. <laughs> Hey, partner. Remember me? Yeah. We're gonna eat you. Move. Move. Yeah. Huh? He's feisty. Be careful. Don't mess this up. I'm hungry. I know what I'm doing. You know, look this way. Look this way. Yeah, Krabby. It's me. How can something so small run so fast? Not so easy, huh? It's short-sighted. They can't see us from back here. So he kept throwing rocks and he did not move until one just hit him on the head. Bingo! And we thought, wow, we found the, we found the way to get food. This is not your average sushi. It was kind of like a, a really bad oyster. We would have been grateful for anything that could have killed the basic taste of that crab, anything that would allow you to choke it down. Uh, but at that point, we were hungry and thirsty enough that it just didn't matter. There was not enough crabs that we would be able to survive on them more than a few days, and that uh, if we weren't able to find some other food source in the vicinity, that uh, eventually we'd die from hunger. After a blistering day shipwrecked on the desert island of Guardian Angel, Mark and Rob are slowly wasting away. They're surviving on cactus juice and crabs, but the heat is a potentially lethal problem, even at night. Our spirits, I think, were, were not bad, but not seeing anybody, not seeing a boat, it was, it was quite, uh, quite depressing. You think anyone will see the fire? Can't hurt. I wouldn't give to be able to peel the top layer of my skin off and burn it up. My tongue is all swollen. Feels like a football. The stupid insects are driving me crazy. Ah! Another constant annoyance on the island were these sand flies. They were tiny little gnat like things that had severe bites. Because you can't see them, there's nothing to swat. You know, these things somehow get on you and they're able to bite you and you don't see them, you don't feel them until it's too late. I tried to stay in the sleeping bag to avoid the, the sand flies, but as soon as it got too hot, I'd open the bag and I'd start getting eaten alive by these sand flies. It was maddening to be too hot in the bag and get eaten alive outside the bag, so it was a constant back and forth. If you fell asleep with the sleeping bag wide open, it was a big mistake. Bites were all over our face, necks, ears, anywhere they could get to, they would bite you. Do you think they're poisonous? If they were, we'd be dead already. No, they're sand flies. They're like uh, mosquitoes, but turbocharged. The itching will drive you crazy, but they're harmless. How do I look? Buddy, you look great. <laughs> you could run your hand up and down your arm, and it was just all bumpy up and down and uh, the welts were you know turning red and, and a bit infected in places nothing seemed to be able to really stop them oh uh, no what's wrong the ring 
My wedding ring. Look how loose it is. Oh, that's not good. I'd been married since I was 17, and you don't get any lighter as you get older, generally, and my wedding ring had been become quite tight in recent years. And when it slipped right off my finger, that was a new experience, and I realized it was because we were losing so much uh, water weight uh, from our bodies. How about a cookie to fill us up? They gotta have dried out by now. Don't do it. Why not? It's about 90% sea salt. <coughs> oh! <laughs> How are they? They're a little salty. Yeah. <laughs> Increasingly, when you're dehydrated and your, your mind is just not working right, the harumphing sound of the waves started to sound like a jet. The sight of this plane going by, it, it drives you crazy. Something emotionally starts to, to tear you apart. I can't tell those people I'm down here, that I exist, that I'm in trouble. It's something reflective, we'll try to signal it. We have nothing that reflects. Uh, the knife blade. No, it's too dull, it's messed up. Well, keep up in your arms then. I remember trying to signal, even though I, I instinctively knew that they were too high and I'm sure they couldn't see me. Look. Yeah. You think you saw us? I doubt it. I want to circle back around. I saw a few jet airliners going probably 30,000 feet or above, speeding along, and there's these people up there nice and comfortable in their seats and probably eating peanuts and drinking their martinis and having a good old time while we're down here, you know, wishing that we could somehow signal them. It was one of the many heartbreaking things that uh, we experienced. trying to do something. I'm gonna find out what's at the top of these cliffs. Look, you have no water. We need to do something, Mark. Anything. And as fun as it is burning to death on this beach, uh, eating cactus You'll be dead before you reach the top. I didn't know what was on the island or what was back up uh, above those walls. I wanted get to do water. something, just about There's anything. Rob, get out! No! It'll kill I, you! I can do this! Ah. Get up! It was very frustrating for me. Uh, you know, it would have been pretty easy for me to climb up these cliffs, being a rock climber. Please, please, believe me when I tell you that <coughs> there's nothing at the top of these cliffs except more cliffs. And maybe a club med. <laughs> With one of those pool bars, you know the type. But the bar's still's actually in the water. <laughs> I'll get them to send down a couple of margaritas later. Tell them to go easy on the salt. <laughs> you know, I remember trying to make light of what you can, just to kind of keep things on the lighter side. I see something. Out on the water. What is that? Is that a kayaker? Looks like it. And we could see every once in a while kind of something come up and slap the water. And we're both saying, oh my gosh, you know, is, 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 this, a, is, is this a kayaker that's coming across the midriff area? Over here! Hey! Uh, this way! Uh, 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 you think he's seen us? I 
I can't tell if he's coming toward us or not. All right, let's run this way. <laughs> and as we're, we're watching, this thing turns and starts flapping. Hey! It's a pelican. No, 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 it's a kayak. It's a guy in a kayak. Hey, look! It's got oh, yeah. wings. It's a pelican. Pelicans don't go kayaking, Mark. It's a guy. It's a guy in a kayak. It's a guy. It's a damn pelican. Talk about a sinking feeling. You know, we had all this hope that was coming up, and, and now the hope sort of flew south. And our chances of getting off this island are, are, are not looking good. By Mark and Rob's third night on the island, both men are suffering from chronic dehydration, a desperate hunger, and scorching temperatures. They're slowly dying, and their families have no idea that anything's wrong. Out of all the ways my life could end, heart attack, car accident, plane crash, I ain't gonna die of thirst on a desert island. How ridiculous is that? The thoughts of, of death start to creep in, and for the first time, I realized that we could actually die on this island. Will it be Mark that goes first, or will it be me that goes first? Or are we going to go so delirious and crazy that we kill each other? I keep picturing our bones lying on the ground like the iguana skeletons all around the canyon. You don't feel that? <laughs> A couple of times, I've imagined a policeman walking down the path to my house. He knocks on the door and my wife answers. The next thing I see, she's crying. I really hate that my family now is going to start being concerned that they haven't heard from us. Yeah, it enters my mind, but then I push it out. We are going to survive. What if we're here for two weeks or a month? Look, we'll be rescued. I promise. It would have been devastating, of course, if Rob had come to um, any serious harm. I would almost rather not have come home myself than to uh, have faced his mother to, to tell her that I had lost her son. When I woke up the next morning, I reached down as I typically do, kind of twist my, my wedding ring on my finger and it was gone. I realized that this thing had actually just fallen off my finger uh, during the night. Rob, you seen my ring? No. I lost my wedding ring. Nice rock. When it slipped right off my finger, that was, uh, to me, an indicator that uh, things were starting to get um, very critical. Got it. You okay, amigo? Sure. My uh, mind and my vision and even my hearing were playing tricks on me. You see something out there? No. The dehydration was definitely the major culprit in causing delirium and the mind tricks. Oh, <laughs> 
These ant colonies seemed to take on a life of their own. It was like I was one of the ants. Get in here. I'll be right in. I didn't know if I was going insane. I didn't know what was going on. It was bizarre and surreal at the time. It almost seems like a, a dream to me now. It was really starting to get to me. I was drained. I was quite delirious, and I was beginning to lose it. At this point, I knew that I could possibly die. Did you hear that? Rock. Sounds like a boat. Man, it's probably a wave <coughs> or a pelican or the cactus talking to you or something. <clears throat> oh, get up! There's definitely a boat out there. Sure enough, there was a boat uh, just a few hundred yards out. And we're thinking, oh my God, this thing is, is gonna keep going. But it didn't, it stopped. And we're going, I think it stopped, you know? This thing is, is sitting there. The motor started revving again, and it started coming towards us. And we're going, oh my God, this thing's hitting our way. <laughs> Incredible sense of relief and adrenaline rushed over me that I never felt before. Are they Mexican fishermen? Why have they stopped? I couldn't tell what they were saying, but they seemed pretty suspicious. Who knows what, you know, who these two gringos could have been. Why aren't they coming to get us? I don't know. Hey! Let me, let me deal with it. I uh, uh, am not fluent in Spanish, but I know enough to get along and was able to respond to them. Hey, que pasa? Oye, estamos aquí por tres días. Mira, mira, el barco choco con rocas. That would have been uh, devastating <laughs> had they been so suspicious that they would just leave us behind. My spirits would have just sank to beyond the depths. There's nothing that Mark and Rob can do. They are at the mercy of these fishermen who don't seem to believe their story of being shipwrecked on the island and living off cactus juice and crabs. Mark begs for their lives. As for that, Dios, no agua. They basically brought the boat around and uh, I guess we're convinced that we weren't, you know, crazies or something. Just uh, stay cool, man, until we know who these guys are, okay? At that point, your, your mind is just so relieved that, uh, that, that you're now um, out of that predicament and it looks like you're gonna make it home. That uh, it's just a, an overwhelming uh, sense of relief. Glad to be alive and glad that we didn't die. They uh, pulled up a one gallon uh, container of water and headed directly towards Bahia de Los Angeles. The feeling of having gulps of water actually go down your throat was just incredible. It was a bizarre feeling to feel your body hydrate almost instantaneously. You could almost feel it pumping out through your, all of your limbs and all of your veins. It was the best water I've ever swallowed. The people in the boat uh, brought us up to the actual town of Bahia de Los Angeles. 
and gave us a gallon of water and said, good luck. Looks just good. And they turned around and they were gone. The first thing Mark does is make an emotional call to his wife, who has no idea what he's just been through. Yeah, I, I promise I'm fine. Just a, a little problem with the cat. I'll, I'll tell you about it later. We should be home early tomorrow morning. It's sort of embarrassing that you've put yourself into this, you know, life-threatening situation for, you know, basically an, an adventurous whim. Yeah, I love you too. Before taking off, um, Rob and I at the general store basically loaded up on all the things your body is craving at that point. Things that are fatty, <laughs> things that have some taste to them, things that are liquid, and kind of gorged ourselves. All of a sudden it's like, wow, we survived that. I feel lucky now that I made it through that, you know. A lot of people might not have made it. What started as a joke ended as a nightmare. Severe dehydration, vicious insect bites, sunburn and starvation combined to take these cousins close to death and back again. When you come out of the tail end of this alive, that establishes a kind of a bond that is different than, you know, a family bond. We share this common experience, but I'm not sure that he'd ever go sailing with me again. 